Hello and uh, welcome to the first uh, currency blog. Um, this is dated um, the 5th of February. And my name is Sean Downey. I'm Currency's Chief Market Analyst. And the principle behind these blogs is to go through some of the questions uh, that appear on the forums or in the discussion groups, uh, pick out some of um, the ones that are the most interesting, and for me to give you some insight into what those answers should be. First of all, just to give you, as it's the first one, a, a little bit about myself. Um, I began trading in 1979 at uh, the age of 16 at uh, Rudolf Wolf Commodity Brokers. Um, initially was involved in soft commodities, so cocoa, coffee, sugar, uh, broking and trading. Uh, also did LME base metals as well. Uh, I did a year when NYMEX first opened um, trading oil. And then I was there head of foreign exchange, making markets in spot. Uh, and forwards um, for just about any currency around the world because it would be um, hedging against metals so we might be doing Chilean pesos six months forward. I then went to Fort and Prebon, just really much traded T-bonds for two years so switched to financials. I then went to Australia, uh, was head of treasury and trading for a company that owned at the time Speedo Swimwear and Foster's Beer uh, among other uh, big companies. Had a remit to handle the global foreign exchange and uh, interest rate exposure. I also traded uh, convertible notes against stock option arbitrage, um, which was the way that they used to take over companies. I was an 87 casualty because of the leverage they had on those convertible notes. And I uh, came back to England, tail between my legs, um, got out of the market completely, uh, was a private detective, not a very good one. Uh, at the same time, I went to college and learned to become a plumber. Um, I've never actually uh, raised a spanner in anger since. Um, I then went to Reuters, was part of design team for Globex platform, which is still in existence today. Also did some design on technical analysis and option-based products. Before moving to CQG, where I am currently and uh, have been for the last 18 years, my job has varied over the years, but uh, primarily I'm there to promote technical analysis to the professional market. Um, so I do that all around the world via one-to-one -one sessions, helping traders um, and also doing seminars and education. I've also had some of my own businesses in that time. So uh, I wrote technical commentaries for EBS, which is the biggest uh, foreign exchange platform in the world, still is. Um, did that for about six years, writing on the majors and about 15 cross rates. I then also write a daily commentary under the iTraders banner, which is a company I used to own. I sold most of it and I just look after the foreign exchange commentaries. The commentaries do all asset classes and they basically use the methods uh, that I've developed, which some of which are included in a book I wrote uh, a few years ago called Trading Time. Um, rest assured it will be the only one, um, not, uh, not a project I would recommend to anyone trying to write a book. Um, the, it's easy enough to write it, but it's extremely difficult to edit it. Um, I also uh, run a pension fund uh, here in the UK, so I have about $50 million under management. I trade all asset classes, so I'm not just uh, in the foreign exchange arena. Primarily, I use the option market um, because um, the nature of the portfolio means that I need to avoid event risk. And so I do take some outright positions, but uh, the vast majority big positions are always based on options. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, take some uh, questions and uh, this one's come through uh, in the last week. And the first one's from Ruli and he asks, uh, what do I think about the relationship between the broker and a trader and what it should be? Well in these days of electronic trading then really I don't think there's much of a relationship at all. Um, what you're really interested in if you're looking for the account is two things. First of all, um, are they well capitalised? Is your money safe? So um, that's the most important thing really. The second thing I think is to think about the sort of orders that they allow you to input. And there's two, <coughs> sorry, there's two primarily uh, that are important. First one is what I call like a, a double contingency order. Let's say the market is trading at 20. I want to put a limit order in to sell at 60. And then if I'm done, I want to be able to put a stop loss in, but then I also want to be able to put a profit target in. So I need to, if, if something happens, then I want to be, have two more orders uh, available to me. The second one is um, really to do with 
not being able to be in front of your terminal all the time, not being able to you know necessarily watch the markets because you've got other responsibilities and jobs. And what that is is to have a market on close order or a time based order. Nobody really wants to be uh, going down to their terminal at nine o'clock in the evening if it's in Europe, middle of the night in Asia, or the middle of the afternoon in America. So that would be the uh, key thing about a platform. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the relationship is as such on a personal basis. Next question um, is also from really it's being spoiled today. So um, he says, how long does it take to become a professional forex trader or any trader for that matter? No hard and fast answer to this. Um, it depends on your ability. I think what most people, um, when they come uh, to the market, is they underestimate how difficult it is and they normally uh, undercapitalized and they exploit leverage too much and so what happens is that they uh, may start well and then something goes very wrong and they end up getting blown out so what you have to do your number one priority is to live to fight another day so you've got to manage risk if you do that and you do that well then the profits will tend to look after themselves so um, one thing that I have noticed on the currency social indicators, for example, looking at the euro dollar longs and shorts, um, the current price is around uh, 138, and the average long position is all the way up at 144. And this tells me that there's quite a number of traders who are obviously very long and wrong, and they simply haven't got out. And what this does is create lots of psychological problems. Um, you get paralysis in your trading, your, your position so bad that it actually stops you doing anything else. Um, and so you must um, learn to control risk and if you do that then as long as you're involved in the market then you will learn um, so that's the primary aim there is no um, exam timetable as it were next one is from somebody called Ekwunifi a great name um, and the question there is how would you know whether the outcome of a meeting is dovish or hawkish immediately from something like a Bank of Japan or a Bank of England or the ECB, um, Trichet or the Federal Reserve for that matter. Um, there are a few clues. Um, some people are naturally hawkish, some people are naturally uh, dovish. Uh, a hawkish example would normally be Trichet. The ECB, for whatever reason, um, tend to always be a little bit paranoid about inflation when really we're in a deflationary world, um, more likely. So um, he tends to be hawkish. Um, Someone like the Bank of England, Mervyn King, can be both ways. He's a bit more of a realist, so you're not always sure what you're going to get, but at least he's honest. Um, a good example of someone who's very, very hawkish is a guy who's a member of the Bank of England committee called Mr Sentence. Um, he was, I think he was the one person who voted for an interest rate rise just before interest rates dropped by 4% over the next three months. So that gives you an idea of uh, his credentials. Um, the pound, uh, this is last week, the pound um, went down on a GDP number. It was weaker than expected, so the pound dropped to cent against the dollar. The following day, Mr. Sentence was speaking at half past nine. I put something out on currency and said, um, this guy's normally hawkish, should beware. And lo and behold, he put out his statement and said that he thought that the GDP numbers were understated, that the economy was a lot stronger than what the statistics suggested. How he knows that um, in relationship to the Office of National Statistics, um, who knows? It doesn't really matter. Um, what we're interested in is the fact that he's hawkish. Finally, on the Federal Reserve, what you're looking for there is changes in their language. So people look at this very, very closely. I think a little bit too closely, in all honesty. Um, and so you, there's websites where you can find uh, what the previous statement was. Look for the changes in language. It could just be one word. Um, I think the last one, uh, a couple of weeks ago, was very instructive in that they completely removed housing as a comment altogether. Well, for me, housing is, is still the biggest problem um, in America, and it seemed to me that the Fed statement was more of a political one uh, as opposed to an economic one, and might have been influenced by the fact that he was up for election in a couple of days afterwards, and so wanted to uh, massage uh, the egos of the politicians. Okay, that's the end of the first blog. I'm going to do another one straight afterwards because there's a few more questions and we went through uh, my introduction. Okay.